Welcome to the Humble Hoof Podcast. My name is Alicia Harlov. This is a podcast for both horse owners and hoof care professionals, offering discussions into various philosophies on the health of the hoof and soundness of your horse. Please check us out on Facebook or at thehumblehoof.com. I first reached out to Heart of Phoenix Rescue after seeing some hoof radiographs of a neglect case they rehabbed back to soundness. I thought about how some of these rescues are seeing the worst of the worst when it comes to hooves and taking a chance on these horses to rehab them. Tania Kramer, the director of Heart of Phoenix, and Susanna Johnson, who writes a lot of the social media posts, agreed to talk to me about some of the biggest issues they see with horses surrendered to them. Yeah, so thank you so much for being willing to do this. Uh, I have a lot of people that have actually asked me more about, you know, horses that have neglect issues with long feet and need to be rehabbed. Uh, but we can, like you said, talk about anything that you see as a big issue coming into the rescue, because if that's something that you want to get out there more and want people to be more aware of, then yeah, we get, we can okay. just talk about it. And, and actually before we get into the questions, do both of you want to just kind of introduce yourself and how you're involved with yeah, Heart of Phoenix? Sure. So I'm Tania Kramer. I'm the founder and director of Heart of Phoenix Equine Rescue. And we started this organization in 2010, very grassroots, small effort, three people, uh, essentially fostering horses. There was not another equine welfare organization in West Virginia. There had never been one successfully exist. And I just essentially looked over the state and the issues that we were seeing and realized somebody had to do something about it. I kind of tried my best to not end up being that person, <laughs> uh, but it, it, it is, it worked out. Uh, it was t- clearly what I was supposed to do. So we grew from me doing the work on my own to a team of three to now what is a team of hundreds and hundreds of people that cover the East Coast. So over the course of the last you know, 11 years, it's been, been incredible and we've been able to rescue about 800 or so horses at this point. Wow. I'm Susanna Johnson. Um, I got involved with Heart of Phoenix. I kind of lose track, but I think it was in late 2007. Um, through adopt, uh, my barn owner adopted a horse, and then we ended up with that horse. And then the more I followed the Heart of Phoenix page, I would send private messages. And I'm kind of like, the, I have a lot of different hats, but I think probably my favorite hat is the officer of education. I do a lot of the education articles that are on our page. Awesome. So I think that we kind of talked a little bit about how Heart of Phoenix came about and how it started. So I didn't know if you wanted to mention a little bit of the intake process, because obviously you see rescues in all kinds of different states. (laughs) So do you want to talk a little bit about what happens when you get horses surrendered to the rescue? Sure. So horses come to us through a plethora of backgrounds and ways I would say about 50% of the horses that come to Heart of Phoenix are owner surrenders. So an owner reaches out and they say, I can't care for this horse anymore. And some of those horses come to us in reasonable condition, but more often than not, the owners have already waited to the point that the horse is experiencing neglect. It tends that the horses are going to be underweight, they're going to be parasitic, and they're not going to have had farrier care in quite some time. And lack of farrier care on its own is one concern. But beyond that, you know, the nutritional deficits that the horses live through have changed the hoof as well. Uh, Often the horses haven't had enough farrier care to even know how to stand for a farrier. So there's, there's this threefold problem where the hoof is going to be overgrown and neglected. It's not going to be healthy because of poor nutrition. And the horse isn't going to be super into standing and letting a farrier work on their feet as a general rule. And when horses come to us through law enforcement seizures, which account for about another half of the horses that come in, they're going to usually be in even uh, a further state of neglect. So the feet, they could have, you know, elf shoes. The feet may crawl up and go around and around. They may have a tremendous, we see a lot of abscesses. We see a lot of stress rings on the feet and a lot of thrush, a lot of white line disease. And I would say that Getting a hoof healthy, um, of course, is a harder thing than getting a horse's body weight back. You could rehab a horse from extreme starvation in three to four months, and the, the foot 
is going to take 12 months or more to really get in order. And uh, we end up seeing, seeing forces staying a longer length of time with us due to needs of the, the hoof than we even do for uh, other issues that they come to us for. Yeah. And so do you often get cases, and I don't know if you want to answer this or Tania, but do you often get cases that are owner surrender or are they actually uh, like the SPCA or somebody has to step in and take the animals? We're about 50 Yeah, it's about 50 50. Um, and that's something to, so when we work, we work with law enforcement. So, um, and that's something a lot of people don't realize. Uh, you know, no organization, no animal welfare organization can go in and seize um, without law enforcement. So, what will happen is we'll get a report of neglect and or cruelty. And uh, we will work, law enforcement will go with us and we will go in and take the animal. And interesting enough, there are instances, and I, we try to educate on this, that your horse's weight may appear fine, but the feet themselves can be neglected and that's enough to make a case. And so it's very important for owners to really look at the whole horse. And, and we've done a lot of law enforcement training for the state of West Virginia, just explaining that, you know, if you... You can have a horse that's weight's fine, or they're or they're overweight, and then the hoof as a result ends up being a chronic issue. And you need to you need to be as a, you know an animal welfare um, officer, you know, educated enough to understand that you can make an argument uh, on neglect, um, and it's not just about the horse being starved. There can be other things that are neglected, and, and hoof care ends up being something we we have to go over and over with law enforcement to explain. Yes, the horse is at weight, but look at what's happened to the feet and no hoof, no horse. So uh, that's that's a big part of um, our our training is talking about other parts of neglect beyond what is easy to see if the animal's emaciated. Yes, the animal's neglected, but look at other parts, their teeth as well. We talk a lot and, and about teeth and dental care. And so, you know, um, both of those things often, I think, in animal welfare at the, at the county level for law enforcement sometimes get overlooked because they just don't know to look at both of those things um, when they're building a case. Yeah, I'm sure. And and so when you have horses that come in with, uh, you know, lack of farrier care, neglect, long feet, um, do you have a vet that's involved that then takes radiographs? And how soon are you able to get a vet and farrier out to start working and assess them? So I'm a big believer in x-rays. I will not mess with a foot in Heart of Phoenix unless we've had x-rays. If there's any concern that there's a rotation, that we just want to know exactly what we're dealing with. So we always have, if there's any concern, our vet comes every single Monday to our main facility, and we do x-rays anytime there's a question. So if a horse comes in on a Friday, they're going to be seen by a vet Monday and um, have x-rays. And my vet is an extremely competent horseman as well and uh, has an extremely good understanding of what is needed in terms of farrier care. So if it's a really severe case, sometimes Dr. Walker will, will do that first preliminary you know, exam, x-rays, and maybe trim or do some diagnostics that then we're going to roll that over and make sure that the farrier has access to those x-rays and what the vet felt was necessary. It tends that most of the horses will be sedated by the, the vet for that first exam of their feed and for x-rays and so forth. But I'm, a, I'm just a big believer in x-rays. And we have seen some instances online where organizations have brought horses in or donkeys that have extremely overgrown feet and the first thing you know here's a farrier trimming this foot with no x-rays and that just boggles my mind I don't so we're just we always have have x-rays done just to make sure we know what we're dealing with from the beginning for sure sometimes they're not handleable yet it takes us a couple weeks to get them to the point where they can even be sedated yeah, that makes sense. Yeah, and I was going to say I'm I'm a little jealous. Like I would love X-rays on every horse that I see, and uh, you know sometimes I just can't. I I don't have access to them, but that's really great, and I, I applaud you for doing that. I think that's awesome, and it gives the farrier so much more information to work with and really know what you're dealing with, what the timeline might be. And so, if you have a horse that has incredibly overgrown feet. 
Um, and obviously we'll talk about other issues that you see, but just kind of starting with that, do you usually do less more often or do you just try to get as much done as possible to get them, you know, comfortable right away? Or what's the process that you typically take? So I'm a big believer in less is more, <laughs> but it really, there are factors that may change that. It may be that because we foster horses out, if a horse doesn't come in to our main facility and they're in with a foster, some of that will, it'll go on what is their farrier and the vet that's seeing the horse at that facility feel what's actually going to be logical if they're, if they can only get a farrier out every six to eight weeks. Um, maybe we would have to take a different approach, but I prefer and find that it's easier on the horse to do a little over time and we have better results not taking a big dramatic approach all at once. Now that said, we have taken horses to Root and Riddle to podiatry in Lexington and have found that sometimes they just do as much as they can at once. And, and uh, so it really just depends on uh, the vet involved with that specific horse, the farrier involved, and uh, what's going to be you know, logical, you know, for that horse at that time. If, if we can only take them to, to Lexington because they need a specialist, you know, once, then, you know, in that instance, we might take an aggressive approach. But if it's going to be a horse at our main facility and there's a farrier often there, then I like to, to do less at first. Yeah. And what kind of success do you see in these cases? Do you have horses that, you know, surprise you and you assume they're going to have lifelong lameness issues that are suddenly sound once you've rehabbed them? Or is it something where you can't really tell right away until you sort of get into it? Um, it's, it's, it's a mix of both. There are horses that I expect will not have issues long term that they ultimately do and we're shocked by it. Uh, there are horses that I would have believed would never be sound. And over giving them time to grow a whole new foot really changes things. I specifically feel like we run into this a lot with thoroughbreds that to me, at least in my experience, have just soft feet in general. They are an FBN souls. They always tend to end up in shoes. But we have one we're dealing with right now that he came in. The feet were just so bad. And we can't pinpoint the source of lameness. His feet just hurt. We've had him to Root and Riddle. We've had him to Park, Equine, both in Lexington. We've had our vet go over it and over it. And essentially what I believe on this horse, and we'll find out in another, you know, six months, is he just needs to grow an entire new foot after, you know, having good nutrition and everything he needs for a year. And I really think at the end of that, the horse is going to be fine. But it's one of those things where, you, you know, you have to hold onto the horse and do the rehab for a year before you can, you know, you ultimately have your answer. We've had some really some discouraging instances where we had this one horse, Fleetwood Mac. He'd been kept in a stall for 10 years. He'd never been allowed out in his life. His feet were probably 20 inches, 20 to 24 inches long, and just total slipper feet. I first felt that there was absolutely no hope for this horse. I felt that euthanasia would be the only choice. We took him to Root and Riddle. They opted to put him under general anesthesia after x-rays, and they removed the, the, the entire, um, all the excess growth, and he was doing really, really well, moving really, really well. It was pretty shocking. But unfortunately, having spent his whole life in a stall, not moving around and getting poor nutrition, his bones were so brittle that he, he eventually, the leg, one of his legs just shattered because the bone in the leg was so weak from not moving his whole life. And so that was, it was a very shocking thing because while the foot actually could have rehabbed the bones were just too far gone. And that's something you could just not have predicted. And it just took the, little, the littlest kick in the pasture and his the leg just shattered. Um, so that was super, super discouraging. But had the, had the legs been not compromised, it would have been amazing recovery on the feet because the feet themselves were actually going to be okay. And just to look at him when we first got him, to imagine that that foot could ever have been normal and the horse could have been sound, you know, it was unbelievable to me. And so while the legs couldn't be, it was a remarkable change in the, the foot before and after. I think many of us know by this point that proper nutrition is crucial for healthy feet and horses. In fact, I have three or four podcast episodes on this exact topic. 
Proper nutrition is also a passion for Heart of Phoenix Rescue, so I asked them for their basic ideal diet when intaking these rehab cases. It was great to hear Rescue so in tune with making the nutrition and hoof connection. And honestly, I mean, all this information is so great and I I love what you are doing. And I don't think that any owner, you know, purposefully wants their horse to end up neglected and have to be rescued. And a lot of it, I think, can come down to owner education. And I know that we've mentioned diet and nutrition a few times. So I didn't know if one of you wanted to talk a little bit about feeding our horses well so that they're, you know, growing good hoof too. And also just the kind of environment and care that they might need so that it's not getting to the point where they have to be surrendered. Well, I think nutrition is important, not just the quantity is the horse being fed enough, but the quality because typically, and there are outlying cases, but typically when a horse is being fed sweet feed, the foot quality, the hoof quality is not there at all. You'll have a super shelly, super brittle, super able to be chipped off, just a terrible foot. It won't, it oftentimes won't have a very good growth rate. I mean, this, this will be the horse that the owner says, well, he doesn't need trimmed except for once a year. Well, yeah, but his foot is not healthy and it's not growing any new healthy foot because his body is not consuming what it needs to get that um, hoof rehabilitated. So, and people just have a tendency, owners, um, normal horse people have a tendency to just say, while the horse has bad feet without understanding that it's actually you who's creating the bad feet because of what you're feeding your horse. And on top of that, I think that what the horse is living on or living in is a major contributor that most horse owners don't understand. If you constantly keep a horse in their stall, then they just don't have the concussion on the ground and the wear and tear on their feet to, in order to grow a healthy, hard, nice growing, well-shaped foot. Horses um, in nature, you know, the BLM Mustangs, if you ever get a chance to put your hands on one of those while they're still half barrel, they've got the most beautiful hooves on the planet. And it's because they roam miles a day over a wide variety of terrain. They're not just kept in an immaculately groomed golf course-like pasture where all the rocks have been picked up or in a dirt lot or in a stall or only turned down in a sand arena. They're going over rocks, they're climbing things, they're going through mud, then they're going through dry stuff, then they're standing in the creek. They just got that variety that just builds an incredible hoof. We took in a horse named Bastille that we don't entirely know his history. He came from an auction, he ultimately escaped the people. He was running wild, one of our volunteers caught him. And when we actually got him tame enough to geld him and laid him down, you would not believe how beautiful his feet were. They were just absolutely gorgeous. Yeah. And is he a Mustang? If not, he sure did live somewhere where he got a lot of roaming on a lot of terrain. And you can't find that in Pennsylvania. So we don't really know for sure. Yeah. Yeah. I have two Mustangs. So I am I am a little bit obsessed with them. But I agree. I think that the movement they get while growing up It just develops this beautiful foot. I mean, they have, if you can get them, especially when they're fairly recently captured, they have incredible feet. I think one of the mistakes that we um, modern humans make, you know, we have a foal that's born and we keep it in a stall for like its first two weeks to make sure that it's okay. Studies are showing that a horse hoof really needs from like an hour old to get up and run around on kind of a hard, unforgiving terrain. And that starts to go ahead and shape the um, coffin bone and the hoof capsule. And so when we keep them in for the first two weeks, we're really kind of doing the modern horse or the domestic horse a great disservice. There's a lot to be said for raising your foals outside and not on the golf course pasture. Another major issue so common in horses is laminitis. Heart of Phoenix mentioned to me that it's one of the major concerns they see in their area. Jumping off of the diet conversation, this makes sense, as nearly 90% of laminitis cases are endocrinopathic related, which is hugely affected by diet. Susanna also discusses sugars in the grass, raising the risk for laminitis. To learn more about that, check out safergrass.org. Right, and I know that you had mentioned that You know, you, when we were talking before this, that you see so much laminitis. And I don't know if you want to expand a little bit about horses that have come in uh, to the rescue that have been laminitic or have foundered. Well, for sure. um, We see there are horses that um, actually will be emaciated. 
but have foundered because the owners wouldn't feed any, um, they didn't have access to forage. So while the horse wasn't getting enough nutrition, they would they would go out and pour out a whole bag of corn, you know, and then you have a founder on that. And of course, um, we've gone into cases where uh, horses are just morbidly obese, especially minis and donkeys. I mean, we see it more in minis and donkeys, um, lots of donkeys. And then Susanna's done some great articles about donkeys and just understanding the differences and, you know, how, how people will get a donkey to maybe be a livestock guard animal, and then they're in there with cattle that they're pouring out commodity feed to, and this donkey should never have access to it. And then, you know, uh, founders, Susanna does a tremendous amount of education on um, just understanding, like, the sugars and grasses, when horses should be in, when they should, what kind of grain they should have, shouldn't have, um, the importance of just understanding nutrition, because in that same token, um, even though we uh, will see it for different reasons in a negligent way. What often happens, and uh, we talk about this within their board of directors, a horse gets adopted from us, it's a beautiful way, its feet are great, and then somebody loves it too much. And we have to check in with the doctors and say, hey, listen, you know, when they send a monthly update, you're letting this horse get too heavy. And then if that horse founders and it comes back to us, now that's a new problem. Um, so it's, 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 it's interesting how much we have to talk about feed your horse enough but on the flip side, don't feed it, you know, too much, uh, because we, uh, you know, we'll get updated photos on adopted horses that just be kind of horrified. A horse was a body score five when he left and looked great. It's now seven and a half. We're like, you've got to, you've got to make some changes. Yeah. And some of that comes from people not understanding how grass grows actually, because one of the things that I have learned over the years is that any grass below six inches is under stress. And so anytime you go out and you mow your pasture down to two inches, you've really stressed it because for every inch it drops below six inches, it's even more stressed, which means to repair itself, it throws sugar like crazy and because it, it depends on the sugar to repair itself. So if you've taken six inch grass and chopped it down to two inches, here it is trying to fix itself. It's throwing sugar at itself like crazy to repair itself. But your horse, in the meantime, is standing out there going, oh, my gosh, free Hershey bars, gobble, 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 gobble. And it's just so bad. People don't understand. From six inches to five inches, the sugar is up. From five inches to four inches, the sugar goes even more up and on and on and on. And that's why if you look out in your pasture, you might have a 10-acre pasture and you've got like 60 feet of it that is just absolutely chewed to the ground. and then all and other parts of it and you're like why is my horse not eating that beautiful grass it's because the chewed down to the ground grass is a heck of a lot sweeter so who wouldn't rather eat Hershey bars than green beans yeah that makes total sense and I know that you had mentioned too um you know maybe some advice for owners about the seasons and the way that the weather and the seasons affect the sugars in the grass too to make sure that they're not you know setting their horse up to have a laminitic attack Right, because some people don't realize that not only does the spring grass have more sugar, most people don't realize that in the fall, your grass is under a lot of stress. It's when you get these cool nights that drop below 50, followed by these warm, sunny days that are 65 or above, then that is making the sugar go way up in your grass. And a lot of people don't realize that if you happen to have a pasture that's almost entirely in shade, Versus one that's almost entirely in sun, the sunny one is going to contain a lot more sugar. Just people don't understand how to know what it is that their horse is intaking. And that's something that I think we publish articles about over and over again throughout the year because we just keep trying to catch people and get them to realize why this is happening. Not just how to prevent it, but how to know when it's going to happen. Right. Yeah. And so do you get horses that come in that are surrendered or end up being seized because of laminitis as a primary issue? We get them surrendered because of laminitis. I don't know that um, Taneo can probably answer that. I'm not sure that an ACO has ever seized based on the, um, uh, an active founder. Have they? Um, so we have had reports um, that have had to be investigated um, for similar things, like horses standing out in the pasture, it's all like stretched out, like there's clearly a painful episode happening. Um, and it's been maybe eight, nine years ago, we did have one 
that her feet were horrific. And she was very foundered and actively foundering. Her name was Buttercup. And she came in for that for that type of reason. It's not common um, that an active laminitic episode would be why they're seized. But it is very common that a horse has been seized because of long-term laminitic episodes of the horse has feet that have now grown in such a way that that ends up being, you know, they're seized because the feet now curl up and have to have slipper feet or elf shoes or whatever you want to call it. So, um, and the horse's weight may be okay. Um, it happens, like I said, a lot more with donkeys, but as far as just like an active singular episode of laminitis, no, uh, with that one exception uh, with that mare years ago. That's, I mean, it I sounds like you're doing really great work and I'm, I'm super impressed with how much you have been able to educate. I've seen some really awesome posts um, about hoof care, about, I, I think that you did a recent post about the grass, the sugars in the grass I just saw, I think a week ago or something. Um, yeah, I did one, a written one, and then I did a video one because a lot of people are better auditory learners. So then I talked about it on a video. Yeah. And so I really love that, that you're trying to educate owners, because I think it's just something that a lot of people don't realize can be harmful. Um, in a lot of ways, you know, it's, it seems like it's the natural thing that horses should eat. Yeah. I think that even a lot of rescues don't, don't understand the whole thing. I think that it's, that's kind of a failing in a lot of rescues too. And unfortunately, because veterinarians go through um, class, you know, learning about I don't even know how many different species, let's just say 20 different species in eight years, they can't possibly be taught everything either. So sometimes we'll run into veterinarians that don't, they understand how to treat the laminitis, but they don't understand, you know, that in the fall, we have to watch this as well as in the spring and that grass gets more sugar when it's short. And those are things that veterinarians just don't have time to be taught in veterinary school. Right. Yeah. Uh, is there any else, anything else that you really want to focus on in terms of something that you'd love owners to know in regards to making sure their horses are healthy? I think, well, both of us probably would like for people to know that we're always available to reach out and ask for help because we want the horse to stay with the owner. We don't want to take horses. You know, there's a misconception that rescues are in it for the money. We're just running around taking everybody's horses and Really, our goal, which we'll never reach, but it is our actual goal is to make ourselves obsolete, to make a world where we're not needed anymore. And so if you don't understand um, hoof care, if you don't know whether your farrier is doing a good trim job or not, if you don't know whether your feed is good or what you should feed this 24-year-old horse when all you've ever had is 10-year-old horses, we are perfectly willing and happy to take those questions and answer them for you usually by PM on Facebook or sometimes we get phone calls or emails. Um, We would like nothing better than for people to reach out and say, listen, I don't understand this. I don't know about this. I'm not sure about this. Can you help me? Great. And, And do you adopt only on the East coast? We would adopt to the whole contiguous United States as long as the application is really strong. Okay. Awesome. So I, I know that you have an awesome website. I've been on it and looked at horses on it. And I know that you always have a variety of options available. So I can add that website into the show notes so people can can find you if they're looking for a horse that they would love to adopt. Oh, cool. Well, and I think, I think one benefit, and I try to stress this, is that adoption has, it comes with such a built-in support system, especially through Heart of Phoenix. You know, you are, yes, going through a process and there's an application and it can feel a little daunting, but I encourage people to really consider adoption first because of the support system that comes with the adopted horse. So when you adopt a horse from us, it's not just thanks, have a great day, take the horse home. I mean, we're there if you run into training difficulties, behavioral issues, health issues, like we're always there the horse can come back to us if it's not working out. You know the horse is going to be safe. But we will work with you to get you through whatever you encounter. It's it's such a like a lifelong as long as you have that horse like support system. And I think that's a lot of that's a lot of value to people because horses aren't easy. 
they they have, um, you know, you're always going to have challenges. So to know that if you adopt from Heart of Phoenix or any reputable adoption program, you have people there that are going to help you and want you to succeed with your horse. We've actually sent a team out to an adopter who, for some reason, just couldn't get her horse to pick up its feet to be trimmed, and neither could the farrier. And so Heart of Phoenix sent out a team of volunteers to work with that horse. And she was able to be trimmed like three days later. We showed the owner exactly what exercises to do. And she was able to be trimmed three days later. And she's been in that home, I think, for five or six years now. So, Wow, that's great. Yeah. Yeah, I think that's the main bulk of questions that I have. Well, great. Thank you so much. Well, thank this you awesome. so much. I appreciate it. Yeah, I appreciate it too. This is great. All right. Thank you. Yeah, have, you have an awesome day. You too. Bye-bye. Bye. 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 I always say that I'm slightly more hoof obsessed than the average person. And chances are, if you're listening to a hoof care podcast, you are too. So we should probably be friends. Feel free to find me on Facebook or email me at thehumblehoof at gmail.com.